Hi everybody, welcome back to the Comstock Channel. I'm Marlon Bowling with you and we're on the road today at the Commodity Classic in Houston, Texas. Good to see everybody here, a big crowd developing and it's always great to catch up with everybody at a show like this. Now remember, be sure that you like this video, make sure you subscribe to it and share it with your friends as well. Well, I'm honored to be talking with the one and only Mac Marshall. Mac happens to be with the uh, soybean board and he joins us right now to uh, talk about a few things. You have a fairly long title. What, <laughs> what is your official title there anyway? So, uh, Vice President of Market Intelligence. Market Intelligence? Yeah. That sounds kind of ominous. It, well, it depends on the markets, right? You know, in, in, in terms of uh, how ominous it's actually going to read, right? Well, when you're talking markets and the word intelligence at the same time, they don't seem to go together this year. Well, <laughs> if you know what I'm saying. I, I, mean, I, you know, I think it's well said. Like, I mean, if we're talking bean market and like your, you know, S&Ds and everything, you know, you got differences in like our local conditions in the United States and you're reconciling that against, you know, the global supply, you know, which is growing this year as South America rebounds. So right. some of the things that are happening on a local level might seem disconnected from the global picture as well. So yeah, I see your point. Well, okay, let's talk about that a little bit. You look at things from a global perspective. We had the Ag Outlook Forum. And we also had the, the last WASDE report that came out. There seemed to be a fair amount of, let's say, skepticism among people when they saw the USDA numbers coming out of Brazil. And they say they didn't trim enough. How do you feel about that? What, what's your take on that? Well, there's a couple things we need to look at. So first, first off, let's consider what the local market commentators have been saying, as well as the Brazilian government. Their estimates are lower than USDA's. Now, right. that's not to say that I necessarily disagree with the USDA estimate or anything. Um, it's it, it's that the you know the, the local observers like putting it lower. That's something that I think leads to that kind of commentary. Where I think USD might be being a little bit careful about it is let's also, you know, as we've had these downward revisions in the size of the Brazilian crop, we've also had upward revisions to last year's Brazilian crop. Right, right. So you kind of reconcile the two of those and and it's a bit of a balancing act. Like maybe maybe there's you know too much of a cut last year and now that's being reconciled. So maybe it's a bit of, uh, more of a wait and see approach. But either way, I mean whether the Brazilian crop is 155 million metric tons or is 148 million metric tons, when you put the whole South American picture together, which I think is the right way to look at it in, in aggregate, you know, thinking about Brazil, Argentina, Paraguay as well, collectively, you're looking at a total crop, you know, well in excess of 200 million metric tons, which is a substantial rebound from last year. Even though Brazil had a record crop last year, Argentina, of course, had an absolute failure, you know, more than 50% crop loss relative to what was expected. So, um, you know, whether we're talking one 148 or 155, something in between for the Brazilian crop this year. Stack up Argentina, stack up Paraguay. You still got a significant rebound, and that's a lot of what you're seeing reflected in the markets now. Is uh, you know an overall bearish sentiment on strong supply out of South America. We're of course taping this in late February, when it's really peak export season for Brazil. You've got cheap beans on the market. Um, all that, all that coming together. So let's talk about the demand side here. Um, what do you see happening there? All eyes are on China. China, China, China. China needs the beans. China will buy, what do I hear, 25 cargoes at a time out of Brazil? I mean, how is their total demand this year compared to maybe the last couple of years? I mean, we did have that agreement with them for a while, but that seems to have kind of faded away, right? Well, there's, there's a couple things going on. I think we have to look at the demand side, yes, from China and yes, internationally, but we also have to you know, reconcile that with, you know, uh, transformations that are happening domestically here. So, you know, China, it is a large volume purchaser, biggest, you know, consumer and buyer importer of soybeans globally. And, you know, it's been in this long term shift in diversifying its supply source or at least shifting it. I, maybe diversifying is the wrong word. It was diversifying at one point when it was, hey, we're primarily buying from the U.S., now we're going to start buying more from Brazil. Mm. Now it's, we're primarily buying from Brazil, and, you know, U.S. share has been has been receding. Um, you know, this year, uh, I think we've got you know, the lowest whole bean exports or lowest whole bean export pace to China since 
the trade war. Now, if we rewind a couple of years, it's been an interesting story. Like, so uh, phase phase one of um, you know the trade deal mm -hmm. entered into force in February 2020. That's great, but at that point, it's not like we had a whole lot of beans to sell. There were some counter seasonal purchases, kind of at the tail end of that marketing year, you know. Um, but once we got to the fall of 2020, that's when China really started and, and had our first harvest after you know after the trade deal was entered into force. That's when China really came back into the market incredibly strongly and, and was just snapping up U.S. beans as much as it could. Now, they were also priced very differently back then. That was back when, you know, we were moving from 850 beans and, you know, structurally eventually getting up to 12. But it was a lot cheaper. Um, and that year, for a lot of it, we were on a record pace of potentially setting new volume records for exports to China. Came in, I think, with the second highest total, just over 35 million metric tons. Um, China likes U.S. beans for storing. They're probably still storing some of those beans. Um, and, uh, and and since then, you know, it's it's been a it's been a value play. You know, it's been, it, it, and I don't mean value in terms of like, you know, the intrinsic value of what you're purchasing. I mean value in terms of price, right? And and it's it's a cheap market now. But to get to the question of like Chinese demand in total, um, you know, there are a lot of headwinds in that market right now. There are, I mean, you look further downstream. You look at, you know, the, you know, pork and hog sector there. Margins have been very, very tight for a number of years, like, you know, coming out of ASF. There's not a lot of incentive to, you know, rebuild more and more of the herd beyond the pre-ASF levels. So what does that mean for China's demand for feedstuffs, for, you know, for corn and for beans? Well, we might be at a peak position there. There's a potential for that. Now we have to look at the Chinese economy. We have to look at the demographics. We've got two years of population decline in right. China. Right. First time since, I think, 1960 that the population went backwards, and that was last year. And then we had, you know, subsequent to guy. And the economy is declining, and the, too. And the right economy's now. not doing great. I mean, yeah. one of the things that, you know, I think is, is interesting and it, as a, you know, student of economics and people, you know, someone who's looking at a lot of data and, you know, using that to get a gauge of the market, um, you need information, you need data. And I saw a slide recently that was just, it was the number of data series being published by the Chinese government. Really? And it, it tailed off significantly over the last couple of years. And, and these are all economic oriented series. Why does that matter? Well, if you don't have good news to report, sometimes that might not be reported. <laughs> and it's those things, I see what you're getting at right? There. Yeah, you yeah. overlay that with, you know, population going backwards. You overlay that with, you know, uh, worries about the banking sector, worries about the housing sector, maybe some of the peel back on some of the foreign direct investment that's happening for, uh, you know, more expensive Belt and Road Initiative projects. Mm -hmm. All of this is kind of coming together. And, you know, I think it's causing a lot of strategists and, you know, people in geopolitics looking to see if there's another potential inflection point here with China. So that's, you know, I think on the Chinese demand side. But bringing it back to volumes, what's another reason why our whole bean exports are down? Well, we're crushing a lot more here domestically. True. Right? And that's that's the other side of this equation, which is frankly very exciting. But is that because Argentina couldn't get the beans? Well, I'm or so, not? Is that going to change? Well, it's that we've got more and more installed crush capacity. Last year, we set a volume record for uh, for meal exports. Okay. Now, part of that, you know, I think is backfilling Argentina not being able to, you know, crush at the same volume that it typically would be able to. Right. Um, Brazil also stepped up in terms of the meal exports, so they were backfilling some of that Argentina piece. But, no, I think more of it is, you know, that we've got more and more installed capacity, crush expansion, you know, look at total announcements, there's potential for capacity growth of a billion bushels relative to, you know, a couple years ago, mm -hmm. um, which is pretty significant, right? I mean, that's scaling up crushing capacity by, you know, over a third, potentially. Now, will all those plants get built? 
probably not as crush margins have come down substantially relative to where they were you know a couple of years ago when a lot of these plants were getting announced but in the meantime we are still crushing a lot this marketing year so the the, the meal and oil marketing year starts october 1st runs through september 30th new october record 2023 new november record for crush new december record and, uh, you know, the NOPA figures are out for January, and it would say a record for that. We'll get the USDA figures, I think, later this week, I think tomorrow. Um, and that'll, you know, likely show, you know, record crush for January as well. So four straight months of that. Um, and that means you're just using more beans at first stage of processing here domestically. So that's exciting. Um, when I talk with farmers, what I, what I get most excited about are, you know, for the farmers in parts of the country that have historically been underserved by processing because there hasn't been a plant where they are. Well, now if you have a plant, you know, installed and that's now your local plant of delivery, you're saving a tremendous amount on basis. I mean, that is money yep. right back in your pocket as a mm -hmm. farmer. And um, that's, that's not insignificant. Some parts of the country, like North Dakota, for example, you can see, you know, improvement of 50, 60 cents on basis. And this is really from, that much. Right. And it, Okay. Right, because like you're you're really eating it in transportation costs in that part of the country because yep. Yep. you know you've got to rail it to get to those points of delivery. Now you've got the localized point of delivery. Well, let me ask you this: We were talking about China for demand. Right now, there's an issue getting it from point A to point B because it usually a lot of it would go through the Panama Canal, right? Ordinarily, yeah. but now they can't quite do that. Not at least not efficiently. Right. Uh, it's it's been What's very you know it's uh, infrastructure has historically been one of our key competitive advantages as an agricultural exporter in the United States. Mm -hmm. Our systems of inland waterways, the Mississippi River, and eventually being able to bring commodities down the Mississippi River, and then for getting to the Asian markets, going through the Panama Canal. Yeah. Well, the last couple of years, this year, but also you know two years ago. Um, dryness, low draft levels of the Mississippi River, you know, cause, uh, you know, say issues of transportation during harvest. Some so barges, lim yeah. limit, limited barge shipments yep. down the river had to, you know, reorient and reroute. Some going up through the St. Lawrence Seaway, looking at coastal ports. Um, but for hitting those Asian markets, increased share of exports going out uh, from the Pacific Northwest. So, um, you know, that's one bit of rerouting. But the other thing that we've seen for reaching other markets on the other side of the world, um, you know, rerouting through Panama. Okay, well, then we'll go through the Suez Canal. Well, nope. now you've got geopolitical <laughs> conflict over there, which is, you know, making the Suez Canal, you know, way less viable. Right. Um, I think I think Maersk um, a couple weeks ago, you know, basically stopped shipping through that channel altogether. Yeah. Um, and now routing around the Cape of Good Hope. Well, all of that means a lot more transit time. And a lot more transit time means it's a lot more expensive. Right. And you put all that together and it, 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 it does hurt the competitiveness. So, like, that's why I'd say investing for continually improving infrastructure, which is, you know, one of the things that we do at the Soy Checkoff, not for steel on the ground or, you know, physical construction, but for, you know, helping enable that through, you know, site design and, and, and looking at pre-planning economic feasibility studies. An example of this is lowering the draft of the lower Mississippi River, or deepening that um, to allow for greater efficiency of transportation. These are all things that are, you know, I'd, I'd say the critical unseen part of this whole value chain uh, that, you know, much like the referee in a basketball game, you only notice it when things go wrong. And I think that's where we've been with some of, you know, the weather issues yeah. and, the, and the low draft level on the Mississippi and then, you know, by extension as well in the Panama Canal. Yeah, it's, uh, I just have to wonder, I mean, the Panama Canal, they're restricted on the draft levels right now because of a drought going on down there. The lake level that feeds the yep. locks yep, is low on water. What if they finally get the the climate pattern to turn around and, and they get the rain that they normally would get, fill that lake back up again, what do you think that would be worth money-wise to the price of soybeans in the U.S.? Oh, gosh. Would that pick up I mean, I, 20 it, cents or more? I, or not? I, I'm not, I, I don't think I can reasonably put a value on it, but like I, that, it would certainly be beneficial. 
yeah. right? I mean, you're saving on transit time, you know, you're getting it there more efficiently, you're shaving on demurrage costs, all of that. So, you know, um, I, I think there's a couple effects there, right? Like you, you, you're taking out some chunk of that transportation cost, which makes the landed cost, you know, more bearable for an end buyer. And then that's, you know, potentially got a demand enhancing effect on it as well. All right, let me, let me go down one more rabbit hole here before we wrap this up. Um, we were talking about demand. There's this big item out there, and it's called sustainable aircraft fuel. Yep, SAF. A lot of talk about that in, in ethanol, yep. in the ethanol industry. What about the soy side? How do they come into play? Great question, because it's something we're incredibly excited about. Sustainable aviation fuel, you know, if you're looking at the size of production right now, it is truly a drop in the bucket. Like I saw a chart recently that was looking at just the total volume of fuel used on you know, domestic flights just in the month of December. And it's many, many, many times the volume of sustainable aviation fuel produced on an annual basis. Mm -hmm. So the market potential in aggregate is truly incredible. Now, we're, now we have to break down and look at the different feedstocks. So you mentioned ethanol. It's exciting for ethanol because uh, one of the ways you can make sustainable aviation fuel is through an, an ethanol or alcohol to jet pathway. But you can also, much like with renewable diesel fuel, there's a, some additional processing that undergoes where you can convert you know, lipid-based feedstocks like soybean oil into sustainable aviation fuel. Now, the challenge here, well, there's a couple challenges. One, um, you know, we've got the renewable diesel boom going on, you know, large part driven by California. And that's, you know, kind of the, the first turn of the flywheel that has enabled all of this crush capacity expansion in the United States. Demand for soybean oil for renewable diesel has, you know, caused a reevaluation of the relative value of soybean oil in the marketplace. Oil is capturing or is accountable for more of the share of value that accrues to soy. So with that, the rationale for crushing has been to produce more and more oil. And that's why you're having these crush plants installed. A lot of that is to feed the energy market. So for SAF, um, you know, what's interesting is that a lot of the aviation and airline companies, you know, there's a preference for using waste stream feedstocks. So like fats, oils, and greases. So reclaimed grease or tallow, um, used cooking oil. These are the feedstocks that allow for a higher credit value for a blender or producer, right? Because they're waste stream, they have a lower carbon intensity, and that's what enables a higher credit. So there's a preference for those. Crop-based feedstocks, like soybean oil, um, are, you know, don't receive as high of a credit in the end market. So the desire for them is maybe a little bit less, but... And look at the volume, though. That's, you, know, you beat me to it. You beat me to it. That's, that's what it's about. That's where, you know, volumetrically, soybean oil is going to be the most important feedstock for, I'd say, any lipid-based bioenergy. That's what we produce the most efficiently. That's what we produce in the greatest volume. Um, that's, you know, one of the... I'd say talents and advantages that we have in U.S. farming is the ability to produce well, soybeans incredibly especially efficiently. Especially if you have more crushing plants. Exactly. Right? Yeah. You no, it, it's cranking it, out more. The whole system is coming together, and that's that's kind of the beauty of it. And even though we're, I'd say, you know, we're in a down side of the market, certainly relative to where prices have been the last couple of years, you have to find reasons to be enthusiastic and excited. And I think as you look at the future here and you see the way the system is working together. And what I mean by that is, well, you had the energy side, you know, effectively create this new market for renewable diesel fuel and by extension sustainable aviation fuel. That sent signals that we needed to have, you know, more intermediate processing and crushing because, you know, as I'm fond of saying, you don't just get soybeans out of the field and magically get renewable diesel fuel. Right. You have to go intermediate processing and that starts with crush. And, you know, frankly, you look at the, the size of the of the market and the potential for it for renewable diesel and sustainable aviation fuel, that means you're gonna need a lot more feedstock. You're gonna need a lot more oil. And, you know, to get that, 
That means you have to have more salt crush to turn those beans into oil. Now, the question there is, well, you can't just crush for the oil fraction, and that's one fifth of the bean. You're also going to have a whole lot more of that meal. Right. So for, you know, I think keeping values up and, um, and really seeing, you know, these two components of the bean really working together, um, you've got lipids for energy effectively enabling increased production of meal for protein, and that's helping benefit animal agriculture domestically. Animal, I mean, we talk about, like, you know, compression of margins in the farm economy. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's been a pain point for livestock producers, you know, as feed costs over the last couple of years. Sure. So, you know, seeing relief on that side, I, I think is, is, a, is a good thing ultimately for, you know, long-term growth of the industry, be it animal ag or, or row crops. Because if you get the, the signals through cost avoidance to, you know, expand production, grow the herd some more, you know, we've been in a cattle contraction for a while. Not the cattle are, you know, the largest consumer of soy meal. It's really poultry, swine, dairy, mm -hmm. beef. But, um, you know, and anytime I think there, you know, is, is margin upside for downstream producers, that's going to be beneficial for upstream. Well, we appreciate all the work that you guys do at, at the United Soybean Board. Thank you. And uh, look forward to more maybe ideas coming out about demand, you know, to help uh, find a place, find a home for all the soybeans that we can produce, and maybe we can be a little more competitive with well, our counterparts. Uh, well, that's America, well, but, you know? but that's the beauty of soy is its its versatility and applications. I mean, we've we've just talked about two here. We've talked about energy, and we've talked about you know an, an input to animal ag, right? We've talked about food, and we've talked about energy, food and fuel, right? Soy provides yep. both of those things. Uh, but that's before you even get to the whole diversity of applications and uses. And um, I'd be remiss if I didn't point out some of that on, on this shirt here, right? <laughs> so our theme this year is soy much more uh, because soy can do soy much more. I thought you were just making a big fashion statement here. Oh, no. Oh, it, oh on, the, on the other trade show floor? Oh, you're going to see a whole bunch of us in these. Yeah, it is a fashion statement. No, like, and it, so we've got, a, we've got a chicken here, you know. For animal ag and consuming I, soy meal. I see where you're going. We, we've got a tractor which is producing it, but you can also fill that with biodiesel. You've got a donut fried in yeah, I'm very fond of that one. Yeah. yeah, that's my favorite. Very Simpsons. Right. And then we've got the globe because we are part of the global community, and you know we export a lot of soy and value-added soy products and animal protein grown using soy. So, 80 plus yeah, countries around the world. I thought you were a Tom Selleck wannabe there, but uh, <laughs> I'm glad you had a, a moment to stop by and say hi, and uh, appreciate talking with you in person for a change. Real pleasure, Mark. Uh, Thank you. Enjoy seeing you here at Commodity Classic. So, keep up the good work on what you do, and uh, keep us posted, if you would, about how things develop during the growing season here. We'll talk more yeah. about uh, soybean supply and, and uh, possible demand and how they all kind of intertwine here. But uh, I, I, I would absolutely love that. Let's talk more during the season. And um, I'll, I'll put in another plug here too, since we're talking diversified uses. One of the things that I'm excited for later this afternoon, we've got a, a press conference with the finalists from the Soy Innovation Challenge. So one of the, you know, as we talk about like the need for moving more meal and that means also potentially finding new applications for it. So we had a soy innovation challenge that was meal focused, looking at novel applications of soy meal. So beyond some of the traditional uses. So we've got Think, some exciting companies to take a look at. Thinking ahead, there you go. Exactly, gotta see where the puck's going. Yeah, yep. that's Mac Marshall with the United Soybean Board joining us here at Commodity Classic. For producer Brianne Hendrickson, I'm Marlon Bowling. Catch you next time on the Comstock Channel. Thanks for joining us on our Comstock YouTube channel. Don't forget you can also find us on Facebook and TikTok as well.